All right, welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited. This is video number 117, and it is, what, uh, 18 March. So I'm going to change a little bit how I'm doing this. Basically, I'm going to scour the Internet for as much information as can be found on the Internet um, about every victim and everything involved in that. So this is probably going to be take about a year or so because I'll go over every victim. It'll take me one or two weeks, you know, three or four, two, two, three, four episodes, however long it takes. I'm going to spend about an hour and a half going in each one and then the next video I'll do one of my other things like about Michael Thevis or the Lover's Lane Killer or the Monster Podcast. All that's important but not as important as the details about the the victims. And there's just very scant information out there. It's been 40 years. Most of the information um, that's on the internet is not very good. Uh, but from that, you can kind of put together kind of an idea of what happened. Of course, it would be better if we had direct access to all the police records uh, from the Atlanta Police Annex, but we don't. So, it's like this. If, um, let's just say, I'm just thinking at the top of my head, the Roswell UFO crash. Now, whether you believe in that or not, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I, I'm not saying I do or don't. But with the Roswell UFO crash is a good example of what we're dealing with with the Atlanta child murders in kind of a weird parallel way. Is that in the Roswell UFO stories, we have, uh, or lore, we have stories and rumors and secondhand stories and stories passed down by generations but we have very very little evidence because the government supposedly in this story came in and cleaned up the UFOs and took off but we do have eyewitness testimony um, and don't have really a lot of that uh, it's just whatever some ufologist has been able to get find somebody and it's them saying that they saw this and they saw that which again you have to take that in context. Anybody can say they saw anything. It doesn't mean it's true. Okay? So, but the preponderance is, I'm not saying I believe it happened, that something had to have happened in Roswell, New Mexico in, what was it, July 1947, because now you've got all these stories of different people that say things happen. And again, you know, just because a lot of people say something happened doesn't mean it happened. Okay. And, um, but something did happen. Okay. And something happened. What happened exactly, we don't know for sure. So, in the same sense for this, these murders, we know that the murders occurred. You know, people lost relatives, people lost children. Um, there's news articles about it. There's a case out there somewhere, transcript somewhere. There's police evidence somewhere, but we don't have access to all that information. So when you don't have, and you know, like I've made estimates that probably what I'm coming across on the internet, and I've seen almost everything, um, is probably 40, 30, 40 percent of what actually maybe even 25% of what actually evidence there is. I mean, we don't have autopsies online, even an autopsy report. We don't have police reports, nothing. All we have is just a few people, a few, you know, newspaper articles. And the problem with newspaper articles is that it's just a snapshot of what something happened that day, like a snapshot of a few lines of what a witness said. A witness could have been on the stand 
all day or for days, but a news article will only mention some highlights of what that person said. So you don't know. There's no transcript. It's not a transcript of what the person said. So it's very difficult to figure out exactly what happened. We can kind of get a gist of an idea of what happened. You know, if your son comes home and his head scratched up and his knees scratched up and his bike's all mangled and he said, I crashed my bike in the street, you can probably figure out that's what happened. He probably did crash his bike in the street or someone ran, he hit him or something like that. Just by that little bit of information, even though you didn't see it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's where we're at in the world. And in, in this case that, like I've been saying for months, we'll never, ever, ever know the truth about everything in our lifetime or about most things in our lifetime you know all we can go by is what the government tells us what the the people's in authority tell us what the news tells us but we don't know really anything for certain we weren't there I didn't see JFK get shot I didn't see Jesus Christ crucified on the cross right I didn't see Moses crossing the Red Sea. I didn't see, you know, the Tea Party, um, Boston Tea Party back in 1775. I didn't see the soldiers landing on the beaches of Normandy. But we have enough information and enough reliable people that a consensus, we all kind of agree that all these things probably happened. Okay, of course they all could be lying. Could be a big conspiracy, right? <laughs> but I think in the general sense, you have in most things, you have to just kind of rely on the word and print and video of others because we can't be everywhere at all times. And some things we just have to accept that these things probably did happen. So that's where we're at. Although in this case, it's much worse because we have very limited information, especially on the Internet. You know, I can Google D-Day, I can Google the crucifixion and find thousands and thousands of Google pages about this. And I can Google what I've done here is Google Edward Hope, Teddy Smith, and I found limited amount of information online. But we're going to go through every single victim okay and like I said this may take me a year I'll do about one or two of these a week and we're gonna gather as much information that's out there right now um, you know and then again don't make me the heavy don't rely on what I say anything I put in my videos double check it Write me an email, post a comment, say, no, no, you got that part wrong. It's actually this, okay? Because I'm not one of these persons that says, I know everything about the Atlanta child murders, and if you don't go along with what I say, then you're, you're a conspiracy theorist or you're trying to hide the case or whatever. I'm not that kind of person. I, I'm only human. I can only go by what I see and what I read, and if I get it wrong, let me know. Or if you think I got it wrong, or if you find additional information, send it to me. Let me know. Okay? Um, Please don't send me your opinions. Please send evidence. Okay? Documents. Whatever. Because, like my dad said, opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. I, I, I can listen to opinions all damn day. You know? But... Send me some evidence. Send me something I haven't gone over. Okay? Because this is a a building. We're stacking the evidence on top of it. We're not just saying, oh, it looks like this. Oh, it looks like that. You know, it's like those Rorschach inkblots. Anybody can have an opinion on what what they're seeing there. All right. So after that, we're going to get into it. So most of this information I've got here that I put on this word document 
is from two sources. Um, Weebly, the at kidweebly.com website, and um, a couple of legal case documents like Justia from the uh, Supreme Court case and Wayne's appeals and stuff like that. And I've kind of pasted all that information together. Got other information I've gotten offline from news articles and put that in there. And so it looks like it's one one big thing here. Um, but we're going to go over this and just read through it. And then we're going to start going into other sources also. And then start adding whatever we don't have. All right. So Eddie Hope, Teddy, uh, Teddy Smith, date of birth, 19 August 1964. He was 14 years old. Um, he's either Leo, which is a lion, I guess you could say. That's his horse horoscope. Um, he was five foot four, 124 pounds. Now I'm five foot 11, about 190 pounds. Um, so for what was he? 14. 14. I think that's pretty big for a 14 year old, right? It seems kind of big. I I don't know. But um, anyway, so he lived at Kimberly Court Housing Projects, 1371 or 1381 Kimberly Way. Now let's take a look at this. Let me find this on the map. We're going to look at every um, geographic site also. All right, hold on one second. Oh, and here's a picture. This is him. Um, let's take a look. We're going to look at links as we find them. Let me see here. That's an IMB, so I don't really care for that. All right, so let's take a look at that address. Hold on one second. All right, so 1781 Kimberly Way, so it's over here, right off of 285. This is, again, right back in Wayne Williams Hunting Ground, which is basically right here, okay? It's almost dead center in it on the west side. And so let's take a look at that address. Doesn't really make much difference what the home address looks like, but still, we can get an idea. Now, again, we're right back where a lot of action happened. A couple of people said they almost got kidnapped here. And then some of the bodies end up being dumped down here. So let's take a look at this address here. This is what, some kind of housing project, I believe? So it looks like it's gated. But yeah, it looks like it used to be a housing project that they've renovated into apartments or maybe the housing project was torn down and they rebuilt this here but yeah it's gated there okay all right we'll go back now there was another address listed on um at kid we believe i'm not sure why but let's take a look at that one take a look at that and see what's going on there hold on one second so yeah it looks like that address either doesn't exist or has been changed since then so Teddy attended Thero High School okay and that's not too far so we'll take a look at that all right, so Thorough High School is right here, and he lives over, right over here, so not too far apart. Now, Thorough High School is where another shooting occurred about a month before, um, similar to the Lover's Lane killings that had occurred two years before at Adams Park and then this uh, Westbrook Park, which is like West Manor Park, which is right there, and those had occurred from January to see, January. It was January, February, and then March back at Adams of 1977. And I've 
been going over how I'm thinking that that was probably Wayne Williams' first foray into being a serial killer. And um, so again, you can see Thoreau High School is right off his little highway, the Stuart Lakewood Freeway that just goes to every place that we talk about. Like I worked there at the, uh, excuse me, I worked there at the Dipper Dens, and then you've got all these places over here that lead right back to the um, the federal prison. But it, again, it's still in Wayne Williams' area. Wayne Williams, of course, is right up here in Dixie Hills. So this is still his kill box. And then over in this area is where he'll be dumping bodies. And then eventually he'll move to start dumping them in the woods. All right. So, but yeah, Thurl High School is where another shooting occurred. The same high school he went to. Um, but it occur occurred in June, about a month before, you know, um, Edward Smith disappears. Now, he was last seen at 11.30 p.m. on 21 July 1979. Uh, he was partying with his girlfriend at Campbellton and Fairburn. Uh, after leaving the Greenbrier skating rink. All right, so let's take a look at that one. All right, again, just literally right across the highway, kind of almost on his way home. And he was last seen at Campbellton and Fairburn Road, which I believe is about right here. <coughs> All right. So let's see. Hold on one second. Now, his body was found about um, a week later at, it says here, 1700 block of Niski Lake Road, possibly shot at house at 1881 Niski Lake Road. And let's see, a 22 gunshot to the upper back. He was found in a black jersey and red letters. His socks and leather sun visor were missing. So I find that interesting. If you just killed someone, why would you take their socks? You'd have to take their shoes off. It doesn't say their shoes are missing. It just says their socks are missing. Very strange. All right, so let's take a look at this area of Niski Lake Road. Now, there's a little confusion on this. Wait, hold on, let's go to this place first. Now, this house at 1881, Niski Lake Road, you see it's just a little run up the road here. So it's not too far, but let's take a look at this uh, address here. Hold on one second. So, it says 1910. Hold on one second. All right, so I, I don't know where they're getting this information. I'm assuming it's from the, the AtKid website. I'm assuming they're getting it from a police report that I have, have, have access to. But this is the approximate location of 1881 Niski Lake Road. There's a house there. I don't know if that's the same house that was there 40 years ago because a lot of times what happens is, you know, it could be the house could have been there and then the house has been torn down. Someone bought the property and built another house. So I don't know. But apparently at this house, um, I, I don't know how they traced this, but Alfred Evans, the other victim that was found, was taking some kind of martial arts lessons here. Okay, so apparently how I can imagine that happened is they're interviewing family and friends and stuff, and he goes, Niski Lake Road, yeah. Well, you know, he was taking martial arts lessons over off of Niski Lake Road. Now, 
This one's really interesting, and it could be because it's there's been development. But if you follow this um, address up to 1700 Nisky Lake Road, it's going to put you right up in this neighborhood here. It's quite a distance. I mean, if you're driving, it's not that far, but, you know. Hold on one second. All right. So, if you, on the AtKid website, I'm assuming they got this from a police report, it either says 1700 Nisky Lake Road or the 1700 block. So that would put you approximately right here. Now this, of course, ne didn't look like this back in the time. I remember seeing the videos. It was just an empty forest, and there was an old dirt red road going back here. And his body was found, I believe, by someone looking for cans or whatever, and then someone else, you know, a dog finds it. Uh, but it wasn't very far off the road. So apparently he got shot in the back. Now whether he was shot in the back at this location or... I, I don't know. And whether they were both killed and deposited at the same time or one was killed and deposited and another one was killed and deposited, who knows? Who knows what happened? But very, very interesting. Again, if this is woods and there's just a dirt road, old chubby, you know, five foot, well, what was Wayne Williams? About five foot four, five foot six, whatever, five foot eight. Uh, Wayne Williams is not going to be dragging, carrying bodies way back here in the woods. It's going to be very close. you got an embankment here. So there was probably a continuation of this ditch here. So he probably went past the ditch a little bit and then dumped it in the grass. But who knows? Again, if we had police reports, if we had something professional to look at, we could get a lot better idea, you know. Because they would put in there, the body was found, you know, 30 feet, approximately, this would be east of Nisky Lake Road at the 1700 block. Then we'd have, have something to go with. But anyway, I wonder if people in this neighborhood, you know, when they're buying this house, if the realtor tells them, yeah, that these kids that started off the Atlanta child murders were dumped right here in your, where your yard is. <laughs> That would be interesting to find out. Anyway, um, all right, so there's find a grave. This is I'm not going to go into that. That's where he's buried at. Um, here's a video that I have from my notes here, so we'll take a look at that. All right, so this is from, of course, Foggy Milson's, um, web uh, YouTube site. Great stuff. I highly recommend it. Go there. Not only does he have uh, news clips from the uh, Atlanta child murders, he's got a lot of stuff on a lot of things. But especially, you know, I've, I've probably pulled 100, 200 videos, news clip videos from his, his uh, YouTube site. And uh, so this one is from July 30th, so just a few days after, okay? Um, so let's take a look and see what this news article... And he's pulling these from the... Walter J. Brown something archives. It's uh, Georgia State or G University of Georgia uh, video archives. So let's take a look here. So you see how, let, let's back up here. Hold on one second. Okay, so you see how the woods are right there. You can see the, where it slopes off in the embankment here. So you can kind of tell that that area is still this area. All right, so you can tell. Just look back here. You see how that road, maybe even the same telephone pole. So let's take a look where that telephone pole's at. Hold on one second. You see that telephone pole right there? 
So we're right in the same area. Uh, so the bodies are found back in here. And there's a telephone pole. Now that may be a different telephone pole. It might be a, a little further up the road. It might be this telephone pole. But it looks like, because usually what happens when they, they make a new neighborhood, they put a feeder telephone pole here and then they run all the lines through there but if I was a gambling man you see it's got is that a light hold on yeah you see it's got like a little light right there I think that is a light hold on yeah you see the light right there and these are I can tell by the little blue um, sensor they had these sensors that they had on these street lights back in the 70s and 80s and it would detect when the sunlight went went down so when it's sunset and then the lights would come on so they had these little blue sensors on there I don't think they use those anymore but but if you look in the video you can see the light right there so right in here right in here is where they found the bodies which makes sense so you know but again you got little chubby Wayne Williams you don't think he's gonna be dragging bodies too far so he's just gonna throw the body down the embankment he may go down there and drag it behind a bush or cover it up but you know can you see old chubby fat Wayne Williams trying to scamper up this embankment here but it's a good place because not a lot of people going along this road are going to be looking into that embankment. But someone was looking for, what, cans or a dog or something like that. And they smelt something and then they they found the body. But anyway, so that's, that's most likely the location right there where the car police cars are at. So let's take a look. Yeah. And again, so that kind of bothers me. So if it's only a week, so if Alfred Evans is the oldest one, it's only been a week. How's the body get um, so decomposed they can't even recognize him just in a week? He's out there in the open in the summer, right? And there's animals and stuff like that. But, I mean, he's not going to be that decomposed in a week, I wouldn't think. Um I mean, we had bodies that were floating in the river for a week, you know, before they were found, and they were still able to identify them. So I, that's the problem. We all know, at least from the information we got, that a week before, Alfred Evans was at a party with his girlfriend. So he was alive. It's not like he's been dead for like a month. Not Alfred Evans, excuse me. Um, Teddy Hope Smith was alive, and we all know that Alfred Evans was alive because someone gave him a ride over there over there to um, in front of the uh, Camelot Camelot Theater right by the Fox Theater to go see a movie so we all know that he was alive because he he actually disappeared a couple of days after Evans so how one of these two bodies could get to be so could decompose in less than a week I'm not quite sure. Anyway, so we'll keep going here. Yeah, check out that hairstyle. So did did Alfred Evans did um, parents not notify the police that he was missing? That's interesting. 
But yeah, so this is the very, very, very beginning. We're at the beginning of the beginning. Nobody knows exactly what's going on, and nobody knows what we're in for, okay? So they're just treating it as, um, you know, another homicide, and unfortunately, you know, you got all these white guys in the police department, all these white guys in the coroner's office, and oh, it's just another dead black kid, right? That's the way they're kind of looking at it. Oh, it's just a bunch of another dead black kid, and we'll just identify him, then, you know, hand the body back to the, the parents. They don't know they're dealing with a serial killer right now, okay? This is what, why it took so long. You know, after the 10th one, they finally said, oh, well, maybe, maybe we do have a serial killer, especially after Camille Bell is running around screaming and yelling. You know, hey, you got a serial killer out there. Oh, no, you just don't be hysterical. So, again, we're right at the beginning of the beginning. We've all been there, not with serial killers and murderers. We've all been there in our life at the beginning of something that changed our life. Okay? You went on that first date. You ran into a girl at the library or whatever. That was the beginning of the beginning. And you didn't know that eventually... You would marry, you know, go on a date with that girl, marry that girl, have children, uh, buy a house, have, you know, go on vacations, and you'd have a whole lifetime of things in, you know, 40, 50 years. And then that was the beginning was them running, you know, running into the library or bumping into them or whatever. That's where we're at here. We're at the beginning of the beginning, and nobody knows exactly what's going on. It's just a bunch of, you know, some more black kids. Like my dad said, there is no serial killer. You know, it's just a bunch. It happened all the time before. They're just talking about it more because they got more murders going on. Black kids have been killing black kids in Atlanta for years. There is no serial killer, my dad would say. And I think he would say that either to calm us or to calm his own fears or maybe his own racist attitudes. I, I, I don't know. But we're at the beginning of the beginning, right here, right now. And nobody knows which direction or where we're going or what we're in for. Okay, I remember this time. I just had started junior high, 78, 79. And, you know, I had my first girlfriend... She broke up with me because I didn't have a car. I mean, well, I'm 13 years old. I wouldn't come visit her. I wouldn't, you know, because I didn't have a car. You know, my parents are not going to take me there. I didn't, have a, I didn't have a lot of money, you know. And so I remember this one because I was working on weekends out there with my dad cutting grass at Rogers Bridge Company um, off of Roosevelt Highway down there, Fairburn which is just south of this area, as the crow flies, I guess you could say. So it wasn't too far away. And I remember I'd be cutting the grass and looking in the woods north just for any strange people and stuff like that. But, again, I hate to say this, the way a lot of white people, like me and my generation, we all grew up, we didn't really pay much attention to these things because oh it's just on the black part of town and there was a black part of town okay which is southwest southeast and you know west atlanta so we didn't pay much attention to it you know and but then it got to everybody it got everyone's attention and um even though we're a bunch of white kids you know i i'm almost the same age i'm like 13 He's, what, 14? So, you know, it. we're at the beginning of the beginning. Nobody knows where this is going to lead. Nobody knows the significance of what's going to happen in the next two years. Because think about it. It would take two years for Wayne Williams to get caught. He doesn't even get indicted until beginning of July 1981. So, it's two years, and... I remember these years as the darkest days, okay, because for me, it was the darkest days, because right around this time, 
end of the summer, my dad lost his job at Rogers Bridge Company. The company, they laid off a bunch of people and he had to go find, he was scrambling, finding a job. He had some drinking problems. Um, I remember, you know, there was the, um, what was that? Uh, the, the Iranian hostage crisis happened in November and all that humiliation. There was the failed rescue attempt. There was the uh, Jonestown massacre. Um, here I was, happy to be a preteen, running around in the woods with my Star Wars toys. And now, uh, you know, I can't play Star Wars because I'm a junior high. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting interested in girls, but girls don't like me. And I'm, I'm just this goofy kid with, you know, this big long afro and not you know like a poodle not too many people girls paid attention to me um but this was a pretty you know becoming a teenager no longer being a child and you know we basically had the woods in the store and school and home and that was it but this whole thing that we're starting at the beginning of the beginning right here um exposed me to the world that it's a dangerous place um, you know before we were superheroes and playing Star Wars and life was good but it, it at this time 13, 14, 15, 8, you know 79, 80, 81 really exposed me to the world you know, we started venturing out to Lenox Square instead of going to South Lake Mall. And um, we realized that, yeah, there were a lot of great things about the world, but there was also a lot of danger. Okay. And this was one of the aspects of danger. Who's killing these kids? Why would they be killing kids? You know, why, why, why is this person doing this? And are they coming for us? And are we next? And... So, we couldn't go run around and play in the woods hardly anymore. I mean, we did, uh, but we were always self-alert after that, you know. It really, it really, it changed our perspective as children. As, I mean, Wayne Williams ruined my childhood, I guess you could say. I no longer was a child anymore after the Atlanta child murders. He forced us to be fearful adults. And you can't go back to being, you know, an innocent, happy kid once you become a fearful adult. Anyway. Anyway, so this is the beginning of the beginning. We don't realize that that's where we're at. And again, like I said, all these children, you know, think about the life that was cut short. Like I went over before, I went over whole all the names and, you know, Eddie Hope Smith, he could have been a baseball player. He could have been the next mayor of Atlanta. Alfred Evans could have been a famous martial artist movie actor, you know, like, uh, what was that guy in Blade, you know, so all these lives were cut short for no reason by a selfish person, Wayne Williams and possibly others, and you think about the missed potential, and also you think about not just the victims, you think about the thousands of black especially black, because it was happening in the black neighborhoods, and white children who stopped being children that summer of 1979 and were forced into being adults, you know, making adult decisions at 12, 13 years old, you know, walking home every day from school by themselves and not knowing if the next car that came by was going to be the killer and you're going to be kidnapped and killed and not see your your family ever again. God knows what would happen to you. So he changed the psychological damage 
that he did to a whole generation, my generation, you know, we'll never get over that. We're all still damaged. I mean, I guess in a sense, the reason I've done, what, 117 videos is because it's therapy for me. You know, I could have gone out and gotten into drugs and drinking and alcohol and, you know, beat my dog and whatever. But I chose not to. I chose to learn from this, you know. But that's just me. There are others that, you know, didn't. The, these psychological damage, okay, of not knowing. And then Wayne Williams keeps this myth going that, you know, it's others and it wasn't me, it was this group or that group. That the killer could still be out there is just, you know, too much psychologically for some people. Um, but I guess that's one of the reasons I've been doing these videos is just searching. I, you know, I thought about it for years, especially back in 2019 and uh, you know I was like well no the guy's in jail the guy's in prison what good will it do and I guess in a selfish way I wanted to find out more and I found out a lot more I mean way more than I ever 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 imagined I mean because up until a year ago I was thinking yeah it was just this couple of minutes of encounters twice with Wayne Williams and that was it and that's about the extent of it right and then there's the fear but now I find out you know that the same game room I'd go into at the Omni Wayne Williams is probably scouting for for kids in there and then right across the road from where my mom was working in Buckhead while I'm washing cars, Wayne Williams is taping children just five minutes away over there on Shadowline at the studio. Okay? So, and then, you know, the same Uncle Mickey that I knew was a pornographer who owned all these studios that Wayne Williams would end up auditioning children and all these lawyers that had worked exclusively just for Michael Davis and no one else end up working for and helping Wayne Williams and those connections there so I never would have known any of this if I hadn't have taken the time to study and that's why these videos are not just some kind of scripted, organized, you know, 60-minute video that's been edited down and got interviews and shit like that. This is just me doing what I do, researching, and learning to, learning also. I've been learning different places and techniques to, to research. So it's been a learning process for me. I've learned a lot from this. I've learned a lot on how to find things. I've had, learned a lot on how to learn. I've learned a lot on how to just, you know, let things go. And I'm hoping that from my lessons that other people that are suffering, you know, when I look at the video statistics, it's everybody my age and older watching these videos. There's nobody in their 20s or 30s watching these videos. So I know there's some people out there that are 50 years old, they got kids, they got grandkids, they got jobs, they got houses, they got car payments, house payments, and they're, you know, sitting there in their man cave at night watching these videos or listening to these videos and learning, trying to find something, some answers that they didn't have before, and again, I hate to disappoint you. I don't have all the answers. I'll never have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. But, like I've been doing here, the last 117 videos, and what we're going to keep doing is we're going to learn. Hopefully we'll learn together and, you know, try to make some sense 
of a senseless senseless acts that happened you know whether you're a brother or cousin or you know a friend of one of these victims what happened to these children it's totally senseless should have never happened it says something about our culture because Wayne Williams grew up in America in our culture it's not like some he came from Venus or from some different planet or a different country you know it's not like you know Trump would say Mexico is not sending their their finest they're sending their rapists and their murderers well Wayne Williams is not from Mexico he's not from El Salvador Wayne Williams grew up in our society in our neighborhoods amongst us but yet he became the monster that tormented us and still torments some of you today so we're at the beginning here this is the very very beginning unfortunately you know there's you know in the Star Wars movies there's you know in a galaxy you see that scroll up in a galaxy long you know far far away at a time long long ago we're at the beginning and we don't know that there's going to be a whole story with this ups and downs and and you know at least in the movies they end you know and they live happily ever after they root off into the sunset together or whatever but in reality what we learn what I've learned is that stories don't always end like that it ends ambiguously that yeah I think we got him I'm pretty sure we got him the evidence the majority of the evidence in the police and the courts and the forensics seems to think that we got him right we got the right guy right but what the reality is is that I'm pretty sure we got the right guy but I'm not a hundred percent sure and there may be others involved and that's why I'm trying to explore here with what little evidence that I'm able to find online okay and I doubt even if I was sitting in Atlanta today and had access to all the records and go down to the annex you know 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day for years on end and read every single report and make copies of every single report and followed down on every name and interviewed everybody that's involved in in the reports and looked at every autopsy report I doubt <clears throat> I'd still have complete closure but anyway we're at the beginning this is the beginning the beginning of the beginning of the beginning unfortunately Edward Hope Smith was the first at least that was found and that disappeared um so we're going to keep going and keep learning and try to get some closure okay cuz that's what I think most people need is closure to not be fearful to not be angry anymore to not have the anxiety you know, if you're sitting there in your basement and you're drinking, you know, I don't know if people drink a fifth of whiskey, some Jack Daniel, whatever, while you're watching this video, stop it. You're not helping yourself. Okay? Or you're popping some pills, stop it. The monster is in jail, hopefully. That time is over. What we have now, we should have had the last 40 years is healing time, okay? And if you're not right in your mind or right in your body or your mental health, you need to go get some help. You need to talk to somebody. You need to talk to your wife. Talk to your minister. Talk to your rabbi. Talk to your imam. Talk to your doctor. Somebody, okay? Anyway, that's my... 10 cents of mental health hopefully that'll help you but I, I it's helped me I, I was probably spent out of the last 40 years I probably spent 10 years 
in therapy talking to people. Four, five different therapists. Not just about this, but other things also. But, you know, one of the things I've learned is I don't have to be a victim of Wayne Williams or other people today unless I choose to be a victim. The only one that controls my life is me. Me. Okay? How I react to that, that's under my control. Wayne Williams is not sending out vibes from the his gel cell and controlling hundreds of thousands of, of people. Okay? It's you, yourself, that's doing that to yourself. So, let it go, talk to somebody, and try to move on. Don't bury the past, but deal with it. And, and try to move on. And like I said, one of the hardest things for me that really depressed me and sunk me and almost destroyed me was what if, what if that day that I saw Wayne Williams with Lee Terrell, I had said something to the police. Maybe he'd be alive today, you know. Less than half of the kids were killed by the time I saw Wayne Williams in July of 1980. He went on a killing spree after I saw him. So, out of 29, 30 kids, you know, that's what drives me crazy. That's what really almost destroyed me is that 15 children, 15 families could still have some happiness and 15 children and husbands and and parents and granddads could be alive today if I had opened my mouth and said something. And that's that's on me. And I accept that and I should have said something, but you know, like I've talked to therapists and you know, I was fourteen years old. My 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 dad told me not to say anything. So No, that was that's still hard to think about today you know the what if and here we are at the beginning and a year later I'll have to deal with my what if you know um, but that's the thing it's like you can't control everything in life you can control how you react you can control if you choose to get angry or get upset or let it go but all that that's what you can control is your little what you put your arms out in front of you and wave them around that's about as much space as you control but that's still very powerful because you can control your own emotions and your own self and how you react whether you choose to get angry or choose to drink or choose to hit somebody or choose to go off and kill yourself or choose to say no you know I, I can't control everything but there are some things I can control and I'm gonna do my best to get up every day and make the world a better place okay as best I can you know there's gonna be fucking Kim Jong-un's there's gonna be Charles Manson's there's gonna be Putin and his nuclear fucking missiles there's going to be craziness in the Middle East I can't control that but I can control you know how I react what I think about and what I do from this moment on every day I can't go back and put the genie back in the bottle and call the police and 
you know, I didn't know who Wing Wing was. I didn't, just some other black guy with an afro. So it's, even if I did call the police, you know, I'd give a description like the other people did, you know. Um, that's one thing my dad told me. He's like, you, you tell me. He, he threw down the newspaper with all the kids' pictures, the ten kids, and says, you tell me which kid it was that you saw, and then we'll go to the police. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't tell him. Because they all look the same to me, okay? I hate to say that, but that's just the facts. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm rambling on here. Okay, so we're at the beginning. Here's Edward Hope Smith. And we move on. All right. <sighs> okay. Um, let's see, let's see. It says, the disappearance of Atlanta child victim uh, Edward Hope Smith parents interview August 2nd. So they found the body. So let's take a look and see what they say. Hold on one sec. All right. So here we go. Wow. So imagine that, that your son's disappeared. The police have found a body, but they haven't been able to identify it yet. That that could be your son, but the police haven't identified him yet. Uh, anyway. Um, hmm. All right. So we'll go on to the... Uh, all right, so this one is from his neighborhood, uh, but this is like almost, this is like March 1981. And you see how this area looks completely different than the one we were looking at. So they probably either tore all this down and rebuilt apartments there, or they extremely renovated them. But anyway, let's take a look here. So, Highland 
Tepwood, the Parents Association president, has led his people to take out bats. This president is leading her group to closer cooperation with police. Because it started long before the child murders did, and now it's paying off. Ruth initiates the relationship, and we establish the relationship by inviting these people into our community and letting them know that something adverse was going on that we weren't going to accomplish. And while they are sad they lost at the head smith, she says that doesn't mean they have to start their own police department. We would rather have professionals do it. Alright, hold on one second. So, if you do a Google search of Edward Hope Smith, um, you're not going to find a lot. So, you get your standard, and this one I did a police report search, there's nothing there. Um, you get the Wikipedia article, you get the Weebly at Kid account you get a find a grave but no police report nothing and there it is right there let's see is he even yeah it doesn't even show specifically where he was buried at did they have enough of a body to be buried I wonder anyway yeah, woman was hunting for empty bottles. So that 22, the thing, you know, I want to know is, did they find a weapon at Wayne Williams' house? Did they find a 22 caliber weapon, a rifle, or a, uh, a pistol? Did they test fire it? Did they compare the shells? You know, because this is one of the ones the very first beginning and so like it's the beginning for us it's also the beginning very very beginning of Wayne Williams killing career okay so he's not sure exactly what's gonna work so that's why I think he shot the first one or maybe the guy tried to break away and ran that's why he shoots you know you shoot him in the back if you're confronting someone and you know you shoot them you're gonna shoot them from the front most likely right unless you pull the gun and you say run or they decide to run then you're gonna shoot them in the back I guess but again you know a 22 I've my dad had a 22 rifle and it's just a tiny little tiny little bullet I mean about not even the size of my pinky. So to think that a 22 rifle or 22 bullet could kill anybody, you know, to me is kind of unusual because, you know, unless you shot someone in the face or in their vital organs, you unloaded a 22 revolver or magazine into them and made multiple holes. Uh, one twenty-two bullet's not going to kill somebody. I don't. I wouldn't think. I, I don't know. And he's five four, so it's not like he's a tiny little kid. I mean, I'll give you an example. Sirhan Sirhan, in the pantry of the uh, what was that? That hotel in Los Angeles. When Kennedy was walking through, he unloaded his eight-shot twenty-two revolver towards Kennedy and what two of the bullets hit Kennedy one passed through his coat so let's see it's three uh, that's two so six of the other bullets at least five hit other people none of them died Kennedy was the only one to die and that's because somehow they got a 22 bullet in the back of his brain back of his head so Getting shot by 22 is not going to kill you unless, you know, they leave you out. They, they shoot you, you. You fall down. You can't move. You can't get up. 
and then you're, you know, or maybe you're unconscious, and you bleed out from the little tiny 22. I mean, like, if you take a pen, an average size pen, you know, that's about a 22 bullet. You know, one of these pens with a cap, that's about a 22. I, I, I'm not an expert on guns, but I seem to remember that's about how big that 22 was. I think it's a little bit smaller than that, actually. And, um, I mean, it's not like a 7.65 or, or whatever it was we had, 5.56 in uh, M16s when I was in the military. And those tumble. They're made to tumble. So when it goes in the body, it, it tears up stuff. It tumbles around in the body. Um, so I don't know how a 22 bullet would have killed him. Was he drunk? Did he have drugs? Did he have alcohol in him? You know, now that would probably help a 22 bullet kill someone. You know, was he, did he get shot and then fall down and then the guy hit him over the head? Did he strangle him after that? Was there asphyxiation? Was there damage to the head? You know, if you shoot somebody running away from you, and they, they fall down, then you go over there and conk them on the head with the butt of the rifle or a bat or you choke them now that would do it so this is why we need an autopsy report we need something a little more and with his blood type did they find his blood in Wayne Williams car you know I'm sure he would have cleaned it all up but was it in the, the cushions there because if Wayne Williams shot him, not at Niski Lake Road, but shot him someplace else, and then wrapped that body up in a blanket and put it in the back of the car, it's going to bleed out, right? So, again, I think this is Wayne Williams practicing. He doesn't know exactly what's going to work. Maybe he shot him out by Niski Lake Road and then realized that because if he's doing this, he's doing it at, at night, right? Maybe to, that's why he's way out there in the middle of nowhere. You saw those woods. Those houses didn't exist then. So he's maybe doing it way out there in the woods. But how, how is, you know, either Edward Hope Smith standing on the road there and trying to run away, and he shoots him, and then he drags his body and throws it down that embankment I, I I don't know so I find all this very interesting and did they find was there blood at the scene was there blood on the ground at the scene because that'll tell you if he died there or was shot there or shot someplace else because if he shot if he shot there there's gonna be blood on the ground because the heart's still pumping even if you've been shot and you're unconscious the heart's still pumping and it's pumping out blood. So it's going to leave blood on the ground. If he shot someplace else, the body's dead, heart's not pumping, it's going to bleed out on the blanket, but when he gets, you know, out to where he's going, it's not going to be blood everywhere. Is there blood on the embankment? Is there blood on the grass? The blood on the road? All these things you got to, you know, that would be in some kind of police criminologist report. But we don't have that. But anyway, so we'll keep going. Let's see. I, I googled autopsy report for Edward Hope Smith. And, of course, the same standard BS. There's nothing. You know, we could go through this all day. Here's an article. Let's take a look at this one. Got a lot of people writing stuff about it, but... There's not too much on details. Let's take a look at that. So, yeah, there's just, there should be more, you know? It seems like there would be more. And, I mean, how hard is it for the police in 40 years 
to pay some college intern or police uh, cadet or secretary to scan all these documents and put them online on a website on the Atlanta Police Department website how hard would that have been you know I wouldn't think too hard all right so this is December 26 1981 Atlanta child uh, killings trial opens on Monday Wayne Williams the only man arrested in the child murders that terrorized Atlanta for two years goes on trial Monday in case held together by loud splash fibers and hair of his dog hair of the dog wow um, the carpet and bedspread fibers dog hairs and testimony he was on the bridge where the police believe the last victim was dumped are essential evidence uh, prosecutors hope will convict Williams of murdering two of the 28 blacks slain July 79 and May 1881 and there's another thing Wayne Williams not charged with killing Edward Hope Smith okay or Alfred Evans so again we don't have any information from the trial on that so even if it was able to get a hold of a transcript of the trial it would include any information in regarding to Edward Hope Smith nothing zero no police reports no autopsy nothing so let's see if there's anything in here Mary welcome a flamboyant black former Atlanta city attorney with little trial experience Wow Slayton, who has not handled a murder trial since 1974, will lead the four-man prosecution team. Hmm. Interesting. There's the judge, Cooper. William emphatically denied he was homosexual when asked by a national magazine reporter in the only interview he was given. The terror began July 1979 with the bodies of Edward Hope Teddy Smith, 14, and Alfred James Q. Evans. 13 were found in an isolated spot in southwest Atlanta. Let's see. Yeah, see? Just nothing. very very little fibers are never as good as fingerprints Slayton admitted but they get pretty close that's true I love this. The officers stopped Williams the night of May 22nd and said they spotted two bags of clothing, dirty gloves, and a pair of black shoes in his car, but neglected to confiscate them. Well, the FBI plays by the law, and if they had confiscated that evidence, what would have happened is Mary Welcome would have appealed to the judge to have that evidence thrown out because they didn't have probable cause and they didn't have a, a warrant so all that evidence would have been thrown out they're hoping that they could get that evidence later on once they got a warrant which they did uh, let's see oh, hold on one second So I love how they, you know, the news media gets things wrong. And I know because it's the 
four different um, FBI reports I read, I read that said he wasn't stopped on the entrance ramp. He went down like a mile from the entrance ramp on 285, and they stopped him there. Anyway. So there's that article. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, this Yeah, this is another article by Marilyn Barstow. I've read through this whole thing. There's nothing. Nothing in here. It's just the same rehashing. It's like they copy and paste from Wikipedia. Alright, let's take a look. What is this? Alright, so then you get to my world where you go to Google and you just look at everything because you can't afford to miss anything. Alright, hold on one second. Let's take a look at that one. All right. Hold. All right. So we got a few things that popped up here, but I've gone through God knows 20, 30 pages here and came up with three or four maybe related articles. And you could just keep going on for thousands of pages, but I don't know how Google really sets up their criteria on this, but see, this is weird. Edward Teddy Hope Smith's non-erotic poetry. I mean, what the hell is that? It's got his name. I just don't understand how someone could have the same exact name. Very strange. I mean... Anyway... You see, there's the end right there. And so I look through, just to kind of give you an idea, and I do this on almost everyone. Six million results. Okay? I don't think that was six million results, but that's what it's saying. Um, but quite a lot. So this is from a Facebook page. The Atlanta Missing and Murdered Children, 1979. It says, 14-year-old Eddie Hope Smith. Yeah, it's just the same thing. Lee Gooch lived next door. Interesting. I thought Lee Gooch lived on the east side. All right, so nothing there. So this is a uh, Instagram page. Let's see what we have here. Forty years ago, disappeared. He was found murdered one week later. Every morning I walk at Lake Charlotte Nature Preserve, formerly Misty, Misty Lake Lane, where the bodies were found. I say a prayer for Edward. Misty Lake Lane. I, you know, Lake Charlotte Nature Preserve is not over there. It's like in southeast Atlanta. So I don't know what he's talking about there. That's weird. Anyway, oh, that's from the Atlanta Atlanta Monster Instagram. Let's see what else do we have. We've got Eddie Hope Smith, age 14, lost to gun violence because he was shot, I guess. 137 candles. All right, let's see what else we have here. Oh, okay, this is this is new. Uh, let's see, August 11th, so what? Maybe two weeks after they found the bodies? This is an editorial by Harvey Gates. 
There's something strange about the death of these two black boys on Niski Lake Road. Last week it's been determined that they were in their early teens, somewhere around 15. It's been ascertained that they were murdered. From this point on, there are no answers, only questions. Who are these boys? We don't know. Where did they come from? We don't know. Where were they? Why were they there? How did they get there? And finally, why were they killed? We don't know the answers to any of these questions. Ted, Ted, is that, oh, oh, the, the overriding question is, why don't we know any, any of these answers? The answer to this question is that somebody somewhere is not talking. There's no way under God's creation that somebody hasn't missed these boys. Black people have a lot of children. Sometimes they can't even think of their names and ages, but they know when one is missing, for a day. To say nothing of a whole week, this is not one child, there are two. Uh, they may be from different homes, or maybe, I don't know what this guy's saying, the parents were in contact with the police. They just weren't able to identify the body as that, as the kid, because, you know, they didn't have DNA back then, so they're trying to get a hold of dental records, you know, and stuff like that, so. We don't know, but somebody does know and this is what is disturbing. There are one of two homes in this country with a missing child or children, yet no one has come forward to identify them or claim their remains. This is utterly preposterous. That's not exactly what happened, but anyway. Uh, particularly when we all have apparatuses to send messages, photographs, and fingerprints all over the world in the twinkling of an eye. I could understand it if these were uh, adults. There are some adults who are accountable to anyone who do not enter into meaningful relationships. They are here today and gone tomorrow. They are out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. Uh, but children are different. Uh, there ought to be accountability somewhere. There were no doubt students to one of our elementary schools. They probably had playmates on one of the playgrounds. They were part of some community, and they have been a member of some church. Children usually have ties in which they can be identified, and as a date writing, we do not know their names. I would be, it'd be different if we were to deal with alien, uh, aliases, international cover-up, secret alliances, and so on. Da, 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 da. Some adults try hard to cover their trail. Well, adults don't know everything because, you know, I uh, back in October of 1981, I ran away from home ended up in Miami. My parents had no idea where I was at until I contacted the police at the airport. So don't can't always blame the parents, you know, because they can't control everything. Um, you know, like this guy that just got convicted of uh, manslaughter or murder because his son went and shot all these people. Well, I think they should be held accountable in some ways. But not for murder, because you can't, you know, even at 14, 15, if I shot somebody, that's not on the parents. They didn't pull the trigger. The 14, 15-year-old did. Whoever old this kid was, 15, 16-year-olds. But um, anyway. So that's all that I have on um, Teddy Hope Smith. Edward Teddy Hope Smith. And this, I don't know why they have somebody has a poem they've written. Oh, somebody has written a poem for him. Edward Teddy Hope Smith. So we'll end with this. But anyway, before I read this, um, if you have more information, more documents, police reports, autopsies, legal documents, especially witness statements, anything like that is what I'm really interested in because that's gold, okay? Um, but if you've got any of that, send it to me, please, on any of these cases. Because what we have now is just news reports and rumors and not much else that's what's so frustrating 
And I can make all kinds of opinions in 20 different, 30 different directions. But until we get some hard facts, we don't know anything. Anyway, um, we're at the beginning. This is the beginning. We don't know it's the beginning, but it is the beginning. And it took Edward Hope Smith's, Teddy Hope Smith's life, Alfred Evans' life, and 26, 27 other young adults and children. So we'll end with this, and uh, we'll keep going. At my next video, I'm going to switch back and forth. We'll go, you know, one on the victim, one of the victims, and then one on my other topics, and then one on the other victims, and one of my other topics. And I'll do, you know, I'll try to do one of these every couple of days once or twice a week. All right, so his name was Eddie, excuse me, Edward Teddy Hope Smith. He was 14, okay? And he died somewhere after the um, 21 July 1979. And we'll close with this. So love has to be enough. It just has to be. For the devil knows this simple truth. To put fear in mankind, you first take away hope. Extinguish hope and temptation, the ills of sin, and his dark times can reign. <clears throat> this protege of death, this new tool of evil, and the pain brought by its need for violence has stolen your body. The decency of a family viewing. Have your mother take these green fibers and bury them onto the muddy banks of the Chattahoochee. And let love be enough. Have love's lasting power grow for you and all the weeping mothers to come after yours a force of peace more stronger and vibrant than the gray stone pillar that now dutifully stands guard over your earthly remains let love change the hearts of the earth's devils shame our leaders and condemn this city forever young now always keep smiling are the grainy images of you reminding us how we all in the moments of a pastime failed to protect the life of hope and there he is Edward Teddy Hope Smith 14 All right, until my next video, good night. Take care.